A very good evening to everyone at Asian Literary Society. And for those of you who are joining us live outside of ALS. We are very happy at ALS to organize the three day Independence Day celebration online called Jashne Azadi. There are three days of uh, treat for all of us present here today. And I would like to give a big shout out to Mr. Manoj Krishnan, who's the founder of ALS, as we all know, who's always been planning to have this online uh, um, independent, all the celebrations online. And well, thanks to the pandemic, we, we are doing it properly uh, this time. And to with us today if, uh, as our chief guest is Dr. R. Chidambaram. A very warm welcome to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure to so be with you. you. So for those of you in the science world, Dr. R. Chidambaram has, needs no introduction. But for uh, lay mortals like us, let me please introduce Dr. Chidambaram to all of you. He is uh, the man behind Pokhran. Uh, that's how uh, we all will know him. We know of him, but we don't know him. He's a physicist by uh, education and experience with his PhD from the IIS. Very recently, he stepped down as the ex-principal scientific advisor to the government of India. He was the director of BARC. He was the chairman of the Atomic Energy uh, Center of India. He was the governor, uh, chairman of the governing body of the International Atomic Energy Association. The list is endless. I think you can just check up his Wikipedia page and, and go on and on about him. But today we are going to look at him and ask him questions as a human being he is. Uh, welcome to ALS, sir. And I would like to start by asking you, how do you see the role of science in, the, in nation building and in the defense of a nation? See, science is the basis for everything. See, you talked about defense. We want our armed forces to have the latest technology, whether it is armaments, whether it is transport systems, or whether it is electronic systems. And all this technology development is based on science, on research and development. Of course, you have an excellent organization, defense research and development organizations. But they have an extensive chain of laboratories which are looking at almost every aspect of uh, the requirements of the armed forces. But what we are familiar with are the missiles and more recently the light combat aircraft, the cages. And of course, you know, when uh, there have been other manufacturers who have been in the business for a long time, you have to allow our indigenous manufacturers a little catch up time. Of course, your critical requirements have to be satisfied. But as long as they are satisfied, you can forget the frills for a little bit and allow them to. This is what the government has recently done. More than a hundred uh, items on the uh, in the defense list. They have said these for which we have the capability. Uh, we have to procure it from Indian companies. So make in India. Yeah. Make in India. So, of course, I must uh, also say, since it's a literary society, that you know, there is a famous uh, futurologist called Alvin Toffler. Alvin Toffler. Alvin Toffler. Yeah. Yeah. Alvin yes. Toffler. Many, many long time back, long time back, he said, yesterday violence was power. Today wealth is power, and then tomorrow knowledge will be power. And that, of course, has uh, come to pass already. And also a long time back, I paraphrased Alvin Toffler to say, technology is power. Why was violence power, continues to be power? Whoever has the best technology for inflicting violence is powerful. Whoever has the wealth to convert knowledge into technology is, is powerful. Same thing with knowledge. Knowledge can create uh, societal wealth, economic wealth or strategic value only if it is uh, through uh, through technology. What is the common in all this technology? So I say technology is power. And that is why, if uh, whether it is national development or national security, you must have access to 
the best technology in the world, which we are capable of developing. Okay. That's nice to know. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, you were uh, like, we have to, we cannot uh, start any conversation or have a conversation with you without asking you about your role in the Pokhran test of uh, 19, both the, nine, the 1974 and 1994. Yeah. So, could you tell us about it? Your What was your role and your experience as a person in the entire thing? See, when I joined the BRC in 1962, uh, I was doing what is called neutron diffraction. We have a research reactor produces neutron beams. Then in 1967, Dr. Raja Ramanna, who really should be credited with this uh, program, called me and said, and now you start thinking of designing nuclear weapons. It was very far from my area of expertise. That is how it started. Then, of course, we yes, a huge team effort from BRC and one of the DRDO labs in Chandigarh, Terminal Ballistics Research Lab was involved. And that is how the 1974 uh, test was done. We called it a peaceful nuclear explosion because the uh, President started. Eisenhower, President, <laughs> yes, well, President Eisenhower has said, uh, 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 swords into plowshares. You have nuclear weapons. You suppose you want to dig a canal. Why not use uh, underground nuclear explosions to break up the canal? We said we agree with you. And uh, we had proposed, in fact, the International Atomic Energy Agency between 70 and 74. 74, they had a number of meetings on peaceful nuclear explosions. Ramana asked me to attend them. And that we had said we are interested in breaking up underground uh, nuclear and uh, underground copper ore using a nuclear explosive. Once the ore is broken up, it's easy to recover the copper value by sending in uh, dilute sulfuric acid and taking it out. Of course, there's a very successful 1974 test. Then we waited and waited for a long time and we got the clearance to do the 98 test. This was a very clearly a nuclear weapon test. And since we knew this was probably our only chance, we did five of them in two days, five tests, test out all the ideas that we wanted for the design of uh, design of nuclear weapons. And at the end of which, Prime Minister Vajpayee declared, "Now we are a, a nuclear nuclear weapon state." Yes, I think the Padma Vibhushan was very well deserved, sir. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it is a very big team effort. Large number of yes, people. Absolutely, work. it cannot be anything but a team effort. Yeah, Bina, you had a few questions. Yeah, uh, sir, we have heard that your father wanted you to become an IAS officer, but your dream was to become a scientist. So, do you have any regrets that you did not follow his? Um, you know, his he, was a, he was in oh. the civil service, civil or defense account service. Go ahead, please. You didn't. You had not finished. No, no. I just want to know whether this. Do you feel this, is this the best thing that has happened to you? Absolutely. You absolutely. No, he didn't really compel me because uh, at that time civil service was a very attractive. Uh, yeah. Kind of thing for uh, for everybody, but uh, he said, "I leave it to you." But of course, I was interested in physics. I had done my B.Sc. honors in physics in. Uh, in uh, Madras, uh, Madras University. Okay. And I joined the Indian Institute of Science. In fact, you know, I strayed a little, almost strayed a little from physics because at that time, all these steel plants were coming up in India in those oh. days after I finished mine. Okay. And suddenly I said, I must contribute because that, you know, you can't remain an agricultural country that we must start producing. So I applied actually to the Indian Institute of Science in the, to the metallurgy department and they had called for interview over there. And it so happened my brother's brother-in-law was in Bangalore who was also a professor at the Institute of Science and uh, Professor Ramurthy. And as we were taking a morning walk, the head of the physics department, Professor R.S. Krishnan, was also taking a walk and we met. 
and uh, my brother brother in law professor ramurthy introduced me he is a young man who has come from he is the first ranker from madras university and he wants to join uh, metallurgy and professor rs krishnan said no way he is joining metallurgy he is joining physics and that's how oh, i joined the yeah. part so a little bit of a strain came back of course my interest was still would still have been in metal physics oh, but, okay. uh, but i came back to Yeah, Actually, last year when I hoisted the flag for Independence Day, I was very touched when you got up from your chair and came forward to congratulate me. So I just want to know how you keep yourself so humble in spite of being such a high-profile figure. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I was humble. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, sir. I've always seen you, and I've noticed that you're really no, humble. Just, I, in spite of having, uh, you have got the Padma Shri and the Padma Vibhushan Award. But uh, you're too different from others, so I want to know the secret of that, and you should. I mean, you'd like no, to learn. It is, my, it is my temperament, you know. Also, if you are a scientist, or even if you are an academic uh, teacher, when you are giving a lecture or, or somewhere, you must always allow for the fact that some young person here may know more on any subject than you on some topic. Um, so this is part of uh, what one would call humility in science, you know, yeah. and, and that is why in, in BRC is a huge multidisciplinary uh, organization, and you can any topic you want, you can always find somebody who you know is there, come and uh, come and be you. You know, in life, not only in science, you should never yeah. stop learning. Yes, that's so it's true. a cliche. Though it's a cliche statement, but it's something you should have to apply. apply yes. Also. Many people don't. So we really feel that. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I think Swasti yeah, can take it. Truly, sir, that is your uh, temperament. We have uh, I've interacted with you for so many years and realized that you're basically a very humble person and very, you know, like somebody very approachable. Oh, so, like that. after. I think yes. Mrs. Chidambaram also, both of them. Yes. <laughs> I'll tell her that. I'll tell her. <laughs> yeah, you must tell her. <laughs> so, uh, sir, you have uh, retired as a director from BRC, Power Atomic Research Center, or uh, those who don't know BRC. I mean, we have people from outside Mumbai also, and we uh, in Mumbai generally call it BRC. So uh, for those of you, uh, since you retired as a director, even then, like even till, I mean, now I'm sure you're called in for your expertise. So could you tell us more about this uh, experience? Yes, and yeah, you know, you're such a busy <laughs> I spent my entire, entire professional life in the Bhava Atomic Research Center. Even when I became the principal scientific advisor to the government, that was yes. in 2001 till about a couple of years uh, back. Yeah. I told the Prime Minister's office that I am in parallel, I must hold this position of uh, continue to be in Bach. And that is how I continued as an honorary Homi Bhabha uh, professor. So I used to tell them, I charge myself in Bach and discharge myself in Delhi you know, for my duties over, duties over there. Because as I mentioned before, all kinds of subjects, unlike when I was director Bach, all subjects I used to come up in the PSA's office, Control Scientific Advisor's office. And now in every one of the topics, you can find some young guy in Bach who can come and brief you on the latest developments. And this has been there for a long time. When Raja Ramana was the <coughs> director of Bach, yeah. uh, he once told me, that whenever there is a discussion on any problem in some committee and they can't find a solution, uh, they would say, okay. now let us consult Bach. 
<laughs> that's a good yeah, that's what the market PRC is famous for. So when you're talking about problems and solutions, I think one of the biggest problems we will face or the world faces is of energy. So how, sir, do you look at clean energy? What are its sources and where does India stand with respect to clean energy? We need energy security. We need energy security. And uh, and now we have to look for sources of energy do not lead to global warming. That is where, how the word clean energy comes. You know, we have greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, other gases. They go and settle upstairs and prevent the reflected infrared radiation from going up. And that is what causes, uh, causes global warming. And now we must now therefore look for sources of energy which uh, do not emit carbon dioxide. Carbon in energy production, carbon dioxide is the main greenhouse gas, though there are other gases, greenhouse gases, methane and so on. And then if you look at the greenhouse gas emission per whatever unit of energy that you produce, then you end up with the three or four sources of energy. Renewable energy, nuclear, and yeah. of course hydro, if you're hydroelectric, but both the mega hydro plants as well as micro, micro hydro plants, or you must be able to capture carbon capture and storage. Of course, it's also a fact that the next 20, 30 years, we are going to burn coal. Nobody, you cannot just, uh, leave out coal so for example when i was the psa we started a project in advanced ultra supercritical thermal plant you know if you are able to raise the temperature of the steam to 700 and plus and nobody has done it in the world yeah. and for the same amount of power relatively lower carbon dioxide any kind of cycle that you can feel you can uh, think of but essentially, the focus will be on renewable, nuclear, hydro, carbon capture, and sorry. That's what the International Panel on Climate Change comes out with the periodic reports. And they want to limit the global warming to two degrees. Global warming. Because the Industrial Revolution has caused this global warming. That some feeling is you must bring it down to 1.5 uh, degrees. Actually, if you look at the world, the carbon footprint of India is very low. Yeah. As you know, in India, anything per capita you multiply by the population of India, anything per capita, good or bad, multiply by the population of India looks large. Yeah. That's what I used to when I used to go to the climate change meetings. Said we are not a big emitter on a per capita basis, and that's the only reasonable basis can uh, think of so nuclear becomes a very important option renewable is very important no doubt about it but it is intermittent so when the sun is there you get it. when it's not there you don't get it yeah so for the base load you must have nuclear and hydel when you can control it of course you can use solar you can do hybrids so for example you can use solar thermal energy not solar photovoltaic to pump up water in small hydel plants and use hydel power whenever you uh, need it or you can use uh, in, in, in coal based plants it's been done in Colorado use solar thermal to produce steam and at that time you don't burn coal so these are all options for uh, for clean energy that uh, that we have and India is working on all this how far is India from being a, making this a reality? No, nuclear is a reality. We are one of the leading countries in the world yeah, as far as nuclear is concerned. Oh, yeah. what, what we call the complete fuel cycle. India is only one of the few countries in the world from prospecting for uranium to mining it to making fuel to designing reactors, to operating them and reprocessing the spent fuel to take out the plutonium, which can be put into different kinds of reactors, what we call the three-stage nuclear power program, 
first stage use uranium 235 the remaining 238 becomes plutonium use plutonium and these are what we call fast breeders we call them fast breeders because they use fast reactors and like fast neutrons and like uh, we use it in the normal thermal reactor where we use thermal neutrons and we call them breeders because they produce more fuel than we consume and this will be using only uranium if you are able to close this cycle with uranium the same uranium will give you 50 times more power then you put in the fast builders thorium thorium in the longer period will get converted to uranium 233 if you are able to close the nuclear fuel cycle with thorium the same uranium will give you 600 times more power in fact i was discussing with dr mohammed el barade who was the director general of the international atomic energy agency at that time and he was chairman of the board and then he said can we call nuclear as renewable energy <laughs> if you close the nuclear fuel cycle I said, let us be modest. We'll call it near renewable energy. Not quite. <laughs> but as you know, I don't know. If many of you know that when the so-called solar energy, when starts from the sun, is actually nuclear energy. Okay. Not the fission energy that we use in this reactor, but fusion energy. Sun produces energy by thermonuclear fusion. And that is something which may come to that's also nuclear see when i break up a uranium nucleus and you take up the sum of the particles which have broken up pieces there is a mass deficit that mass if you multiply by the square of the velocity of light good old einstein equation you get energy but when lighted isotopes fuse together isotopes of hydrogen for example deuterium and tritium, isotopes of hydrogen. Again, in the resultant product, there is a deficit in mass. Again, good old Einstein equation, multiply by it. That is how you get fusion energy. But then you have to take the temperature to 150, 100 million degrees. So you need magnetic confinement. And this is a project, big project coming up uh, in Kadarash, in France. Oh, India yeah. is a member. India is a full scale member. And okay. it is called the magnetic confinement. Obviously, at that temperature, there is no material which you can use for it. It has to be confined only by magnetic field, magnetic confinement. And it's called the tokamak. It's a Russian word because the original idea came from the Soviet Union. And we are supplying the huge cryostar into which this entire thing will be located the entire tokamak yeah. 30 meters in diameter 30 meters 30 oh meters God. in height this is the biggest cryostat ever built in the world oh, really? by larson, larson and tubro under the direction of the institute of plasma research in gandhinagar near Ahmedabad. and the base has already been installed in the eater project a couple of months back so we are fully into the fusion energy side also institute of plasma research is a, one of the institutions under the department of atomic Energy. okay thank you sir you really given us a lot of knowledge now <laughs> hope you remember some of it <laughs> uh, sir i want to ask you this this year will stand out in everyone's memory as um, an aberration what are your thoughts about it sir we had you mean the pandemic because of the yeah. pandemic yes and the lockdown and the lockdown and the lockdown well this was a very unusual situation which evolved out of nowhere it came up yes but then it all gave us time to think and ponder spend time with yourself <laughs> that's true but do you think it will go on for a long time what are your thoughts about it very difficult to say, but you know, you can't shut down the country for too long. The country is going to open up, which is already happening. Yeah. My feeling is it will take some time to completely go go down because it's, uh, it's, it's a pandemic and people are also not uh, as careful as they should yes. be. Yes, especially so outside. Tend to get overconfident, they go without masks or, yes. and, and all that. 
Uh, and but then you see on the whole the country has responded i think very well as also the government government has taken the adequate uh, step to to do this but we will come over it it's not going to sooner or later we will uh, come over it and one fringe thing which has happened is all of us have gone digital more and more digital since you know you don't yes. go out and pay cash yeah yeah it's all the money transactions are now yes, become electronic neft lmps and all that so digital india has got a big push thanks to yes thanks to this unfortunate covid yeah <laughs> that's true um as a writer i'd like to ask you this question uh, do you like to read books which is your who's your favorite author and uh, which is the last book that you have read <laughs> see i like what to read books interest? that also i want to know i like to re read books right from my early days you know oh. in school and college days i am i have almost read all the books of charles dickens walter scott and alexander dumas a little bit of victor hugo les miserables and uh, the hunchback of notre dame he ah. repeated with edgar wallace a bit of somerset mom guy yeah. mom oh, we have i have read uh, a lot of books in those days in during my school and uh, yes college school and yeah. college days then i came up here and later i have read a lot of a uh, lot of other books a uh, lot of other books of course now i, I am a member of a circulating library okay uh, in apnc road shamaru Uh -huh. and, uh, and uh, i borrow books i also read uh, action novels lee child jack reacher jack reacher oh, novels lee child david uh -huh. baldachi david baldachi <laughs> that's nice nice to know that i have uh, also you know during the lockdown i have a good collection of books uh -huh. you asked what is the latest book i have uh, i have read and uh, i read the uh, back irwin shaw's beggar man thief no oh. this was a sequel to rich man poor man rich man okay. poor man because it is their very old book lying over there oh and i also reread the cash 22 joseph heller joseph okay. heller's uh, cash 22 cuz there are also indian, indian authors which are coming up for oh, some time back i read salman rushdie's midnight children yeah perhaps is uh, is best uh, best write up yes vikas sarup slum dog millionaire because he started as questions and answers he has also a very very well written book my friend uh, former ambassador kiran doshi has written a beautiful book on the foreign service birds of passage okay and then he has written another book which is become a, he got an award from that okay Right during our independence, right? Jinna often came to our house. Oh, Jinna often came to our house. Oh, It's a very, very nice book that he has. He has written. Of course, somebody gave me Chetan Bhagat's One Night at the Call Center. <laughs> yeah, well. I started. I started. Uh, yeah, of course, I've read your book, which we read. Yeah, I was about to ask what about Jinna. <laughs> <laughs> I remember Meena that you must say most of honestly most of the books I read are are scientific books of course you don't read the book we read parts of it as you like and a great deal of information is available in the in on the Library. net also yeah But I have to read other books not just fiction uh, uh, recently read it during the lockdown uh, the art of living by Andre Marwa ah. Uh, to come across that book andre marwa okay. there is a very nice book by anthony j called uh, um, management and machiavelli okay. it's a very book of course uh, machiavelli was the italian chanakya you know oh <laughs> yes. machiavelli <laughs> very nice uh, diverse taste sir had no what is so, I uh, I wanted to ask you two things. One is uh, uh, not really uh, uh, something which I had planned to ask, but I would I'm I am curious sir, to know about your uh, childhood days and uh, how how was it you were growing up? 
<laughs> like I'm an educationist, so uh, from the educator's point of view, I wanted to know your views about the education system, like when you were growing up and now when uh, our children are growing up. See, my my early education was in Meerut because my father okay. was a uh, well, was a controller of defense accounts in those days, okay. and actually. The medium of my instruction was Hindi, so up to se almost seventh standard, I studied in Hindi. Then we got came back to Chennai, and then of course I transferred to uh, English medium. Very good schools I've gone through, and college. I have been a bit lucky in that I have gone through some of the best uh, colleges, Presidency College, Indian Institute yeah. of Science, and now now the the BRC. Now, of course, you also have this uh, new education policy, which is a well, a well uh, you are a teacher. You know, this is the thing that, uh, in fact, you may be interested in knowing that when I was in the PS, when I was the PSA, we started a, a project on gifted students. The, the young professor, lady professor Jyoti Sharma in Delhi University, who has whom we funded also in the NIAS in Bangalore, how to identify and mentor gifted gifted children. You know, giftedness is different from scoring marks in school. These two yeah. are of course, sometimes there is a convergence and sometimes and then among them there are what we call select what I call rather selectively gifted. You take a man like Srinivas Ramanujan, you know, who yes. has been called the magical genius, the mathematician. Yes, mathematician. Up to 10th standard or so, he came first in school. Then he lost interest in everything except mathematics. Oh. So he failed in plus two. He couldn't yeah. enter college. He couldn't enter college. He tried oh. two places, Pachabas College. Government, then Government Arts College, Kumbakonam. And he is the only man I know of who, after 12th failed, got DSC in Cambridge. Nothing wow. in between. Nothing in between. And this is selectively gifted. Now, if you have such a person in your midst today, he can't pass any entrance exam. Yeah, yeah. exactly. We are closing the door. I think this is something. I think the new education policy is a small, a small section. On the one hand, they want to make it a multi, uh, kind of multidisciplinary. Multidisciplinary and multi entry points and exit points. Ah, yes. Entry points, exit points. So that is a good thing. But at the same time, these unique people who have kind of a unidirectional giftedness you have to take care of them and here that is the role of the role of the teacher of course the the parents parents are uh, sometimes uh, prejudiced they think everybody all the child's children are gifted teachers you know some teacher has to be sensitive and yes. the question that you asked early no, I remember one of my. Are we running out of time? Sometimes I get the rent. Okay. You have about seven, eight minutes. Yeah. See, one of the one of her one of my friends. He's an Indian. He's an American wife, Barbara, Yogi Gupta's wife. She told me that her small child was, uh, you know, she went to kindergarten, and the teacher was explaining numbers. And she said, you know, there are bigger numbers, there are smaller numbers. You can subtract 5 from 7, but you can't subtract 7 from 5. And this poor little thing got, what is wrong with that? The answer is minus 2, you know. <laughs> you subtract. Nothing, not that you cannot subtract. Yeah, that's it, right. seems, it seems the child, the teacher became hostile to the child. And they had to move the child out of that. So exactly the question you asked. So it's quite possible in some particular point, 
The teacher may know, the student may know more than the teacher. Yeah. The teacher must appreciate, identify the giftedness and uh, yes. uh, think uh, so, forward. Uh, yeah, so let so just in order to ask, uh, you know, like to bring this thing to more like a close, I have two questions for you. One is, of course, uh, where do you see India after the lockdown? And more importantly, what is your final message for our viewers, ALS viewers? Asian Literary Society. For Asian Literary Society. I've always said India is not stoppable. You know, we will grow. We will continue to grow. Of course, we want to grow in a democratic way of life. And a democratic system does put in some roadblock, but that is part, it has become part of our culture. We cannot, uh, so we will continue to grow. And you know, there is uh, United Nations has defined an index called the Human Development Index. I don't know if you have come across the Human Development Index. Yes. And it is based on three parameters per capita gross national product, life expectancy at birth, yes. and adult literacy. Adult literacy. I have said for a long time that we need only two parameters per capita electricity consumption and female literacy. I prefer female literacy to adult literacy. Because it's a measure not only of literacy, but of equity and justice in that society. Yes. You know, whenever you find, Bina Pillai is from Kerala, who so used to have a matrilineal society. Yes. In those days. You know, the literacy level in Kerala is very high. Yeah. There's hardly any difference between male literacy and female literacy. Yes. But then if you go to parts of Eastern UP, Odisha, you will find that the gap, because the average literacy is uh, low. But the good news is, all over India, the female illiteracy is, female illiteracy is coming down. Yes. Look at, if you could look at the research. And also, you know, I preferred female literacy for the following reason. But I decided 20 years back, I think. If you plot, if you plot, female literacy against infant mortality. There is a very strong correlation. Uh -huh. Higher the female literacy, the lower is the infant mortality. The higher the female literacy, the lower is the birth rate. And you know, the birth rate is also coming down. And they tell me the replacement birth rate in a country is 2.1. And India is running, beginning to run pretty close to that. As women get more and more educated, yeah. the number of children you have in this generation compared yes. to two generations, uh, two generations back, there is a long, long, long uh, message. So I think India will grow. India and and you know, per capita electricity consumption obviously relates to per capita gross national product. The more electricity that you produce, the more is the industrial production and the more is your, is your GNP. But also I have shown that the more electricity that you produce, part goes to industry, no doubt. The part goes for domestic consumption, no doubt. That has to increase. That's what the, every government is trying to do. That is bring light to uh, electricity to villages. But when it goes to small towns and villages one of the benefits they get is they get better drinking water they get yes. primary health care and all these have strong impact on all health parameters particularly on life expectancy at birth so what i've shown a long time back is both per capita gnp and life expectancy at birth for a country like India can be compressed into one parameter per capita electricity consumption. See, electricity is the most convenient form of energy. You can say also say energy consumption. Electricity is the most convenient form of energy. So I have plotted this curve. You will find an H shaped curve. And per capita electricity consumption as in India has to grow by six to eight times. 
before india can become a developed country in the fullest sense of the term that is the beginning we want to become a developed country yeah. then my dream is we want to become a knowledge economy knowledge economy is an economy where you are have the capability to produce new knowledge and we have the capability to appropriate knowledge generated anywhere in the world that's what the developing countries have been have been doing and that is why india of our dreams your dream my dreams is an india which is economically developed scientifically advanced and which is militarily strong yes national development and national security are two are two sides of the same coin development without security yeah. is vulnerable security without development is meaningless See, the greatest advantage of recognized strength whether you are an individual or a country is that you don't have to use it that is the principle of deterrence the greatest disadvantage of perceived weakness is that your enemy may get adventurous you know when i give lectures to colleges and there is a large percentage of girl students i ask them to learn self defense if the undesirable character you can give him a karate chop at a sensitive point <laughs> this is what is called retaliatory deterrence but if the above mentioned undesirable character knows that you can deliver the karate chop at the above mentioned sensitive point he will not bother you that is that character same principle holds whether it is a girl student or whether it is a nuclear that is the principle of nuclear tactics that's what we want recognize that the lovely analogy uh, dr chidambaram so beautifully put so finally could we end with you giving a few words for our asian literary society the work that we do i'm very glad i'm very glad see already there are a number of uh, english authors i think your focus is more on english i noticed yes um, yes yes and, and all other languages also asian language asian asian, yeah. asian literary society yeah and you see your encouragement that you give to already there are some very well known uh, writers in english including pina ji who is uh, i'm not so <laughs> <laughs> but i'm also a new writer very very important that we should encourage you know after all whatever one thinks must be put down in writing and you can garb it as an essay you can garb it as fiction you can garb it as philosophy you can garb it as anything that you like and uh, i think uh, asian literary society is making a very good uh, effort in this direction and i wish it all strength thank, thank you sir thank you so thank much, you so much sir. Thank you, you for your time, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you for talking with all of us. Thank you. Thank Goodbye. you. All the best to you. God bless you. Thank you.